With that, I'm sure you're all waiting for the true star of the evening. <laughs> no. The founder of this beautiful organization, my sweet dear husband. I am only here to deliver the message, but this is the man with the vision who created this organization 27 years ago, Mr. Richard Stevenson. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That, no, no, please. I, uh, later, I'll ask some of you what it was I agreed to uh, up here a little bit ago. I wasn't clear of the question. Thank you, sweetheart. Uh, beautifully said, even if overblown as to the last part of the remarks, your remarks prior to that were galvanizing, as is true of you. And may I also say, you look absolutely breathtaking tonight, and I wonder when this party's going to end. <laughs> well, a couple, couple more hours, oh, probably. A so couple more good. hours. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and what a job you and the Gateway team, unbelievable job, have done to make this spectacular night possible. Big cheers, please, for the Gateway team and their leadership, Teresa Bartels. You've heard about Mr. Michael Burton. What a gift. There's our gift. Oh, my goodness. I'm honored to be with you tonight. I'm happy to be with you any night, but especially tonight. And I hope you'll allow me to take this brief opportunity to thank each and every one of you. Our, my family, of course, first. Been with me forever. When beneath the wing you've heard Bette Midler sing. I have a tornado beneath my wing. It's my five children, nine grandchildren, their spousal, not the grandchildren's spousal relationships, my children's spousal relationships and significant others. I am blessed. So, of course, I thank my family, friends, colleagues, and distinguished guests for being with us for this magnificent night of celebration, certainly, and most importantly, for opening their hearts, your hearts, and I know you're going to open your pocketbooks as much. To support the incredible breakthrough, breakthrough trials that we have funded and more coming, oh boy, I have the privilege, as Gateway does, and I appreciate your giving us the opportunity to fund these trials honorably, around the world, like, as my wife pointed out, no one else has. But more to come on that front in just a moment. Together, dear family of mine, friends, grantees, supporters, and those stalwart advocates for Gateway, we're setting, we're setting a really remarkable, critical, life-changing and life-saving course for the future of research in medicine. Cancer's the toughest research task, Jimmy's here, Parkinsonian disease is a tough one too, and so many others. This is tough work. Set the course in the way we've set the course, and Jimmy as well, and you will see a difference in the world in terms of how patients survive and thrive and do not die of that which they otherwise had been told they would. So that forlorn and, and hopeless feeling you get when the big black word cancer is given to you, you bring it home, Tell your family about it with trepidation in your voice and clearly trepidation in their voice. That big black word, which was always thought to be the death knell, it's a killer. It's still a killer for far too many of our souls. But it's increasingly more like a chronic disease in many of the cases in which cancer is diagnosed, no differently to be treated with no different an outcome than you might expect from diabetes. You shouldn't die of diabetes or arthritis, otherwise crippling diseases and maladies, but you shouldn't die of them. That's the nature of chronicity. You just keep treating. We have patients, another hat I would wear, who were diagnosed with nothing but death ahead of them. They're alive decades later because the first therapy may not have worked, the next therapy may not have worked. In the meantime, new therapies are developing thanks to Gateway and your support that do work. That other, that I'm way off of this presentation. Work and work on your presentation. He does this all the I time. I memorized it too, and I don't and even remember it. He practices and then he throws it away, and it's the best. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> in another part of the world, there is an organization that has funded more clinical investigations of those genetic aberrations that foretell your death from cancer because all other therapies have failed. There is one other organization that has funded more of those trials than anybody else, not just for the funding of the trials, but no one is forced to take these trials. We're a libertarian organization, don't believe in force. 
But if you had the interest in knowing about the genetic mutations from which you're suffering, wouldn't you also kind of like to know about what might attack that mutation and give you a life-saving option? That one organization has more of these trials ever. Just today in Europe, the outcome of that trial was announced. It rocked the oncology world. Why? Because this one organization has done more of those trials than anybody else, and we have found more mutations that were actionable, and when you take action against a the mutation, these patients live without the disease, and they were told they would die. That's the nature of what we're up to. That's what we're talking about. It isn't going to get, it isn't going to get any different unless you stay the course. Well, <laughs> while I know we'll have a great time tonight, I, we already back. had a great time and tonight. That, well, I have a great time tonight, every night, if you're at every that well. And, and Stacey said... That's off the script. We, That's off the script. <laughs> and as Stacey <laughs> says, we all like a good party. And what a party this is already. And I understand this party is in diapers. This party's <laughs> in diapers. This whole night's in diapers. Brian McKnight's had a little pep talk from his wife early. And I understand it's going to perform like you've never seen him perform. Let's also use... So we're going to have a party. It's off the ground. Let's also use our time together to inspire one another and to challenge ourselves to do even better, to do even more as we strive to eradicate cancer as we know it today, and to be hypersensitive, truly diligent in our work with the sense of urgency that this work deserves. There can be no greater calling. Can there be? I don't think so. As so many of you know from personal experience, time, time takes a new meaning when you or your loved one faces a cancer diagnosis. It becomes a truly precious commodity, time, precious time. So we simply cannot let patients wait for answers. Their time is too precious and far too limited. So wait time. Wait time can be very, th there's a very thin line in wait time between, well, frankly, between life and death for these patients. We don't think you should wait for your diagnostic results 10 days on average and then wait for a doctor's appointment another two weeks after that. In another world of mine, we think you should wait about 14 minutes. And even if that PSA test came back differently, don't you agree? <laughs> the technology exists, just get with it. You either understand it's about the patient and you deliver those results or you don't. And if you don't, here's what happens. That patient who put his arm out and took, you took the blood from the arm to find out what's going on, who do you think is more interested in that result than the person whose arm was just exposed to that, as my son's heard me say, that cold shaft of steel? Not the point. The blood test comes back. In the laboratories, everywhere you ought to go, you get about a 14 hour, 14 minute, no more than 14 hours in most places, read. But it gets delayed because it goes here, there, and elsewhere, it goes to the doctor's office. It's delayed by whomever in the doctor's office doesn't think it's that important. It goes on a sheet of paper that's among many sheets of paper. You get a call from the nurse, and the nurse's aide or somebody 10 days later. In the meantime, where's your immune system? Your immune system is scared to death, and when you're scared, that kind of pressure leaves your immune system absolutely frail, inadequate. And one thing you need in cancer is a very surveillant and aggressive immune system. You can't afford, frankly, if you really are about the patient, to have them wait 10 days for a report and then to have the appointment set up to read the report two weeks after. That's just nonsense. Frankly, it's just immoral. We believe... <laughs> well, Why don't so you tell time. us how you really feel, honey? I'm sorry? Why don't you tell us how you really feel? <laughs> I do. I love you. I know, I know. That's how I feel. I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank well, you. <laughs> so time, time. They need to feel better and live longer. There's a way for that to happen. But if you're not able to speed up the time for diagnosis and then therapy, that time they're living in anguish and fear is not, frankly, tolerable. We have to change that reality. As a matter of the moral code, we need to do everything, everything in our power to enable the great scientific and clinical minds of our time, many of whom are in this room tonight. We must give them the power to achieve the breakthroughs that will help patients conquer their cancer now, now, not later. They don't have that time. That is our mission, and together we are unstoppable. You've made that possible. That's why we're here tonight. Inspired by my mother's tragic cancer journey, 
I and my family set out to change the face of this ugly disease with trusted friends like Bob and Cindy Mayo, Mike Smith, Tom Lekowitz, who isn't here, Phil Paquetti, who is here, Dennis Lynn, and so many others around the world. And to treat those seeking care like I would my own, would, would I would, <laughs> like I would have provided to my own mother. The doctors taking care of my mother didn't. So I founded Cancer Treatment Centers of America as a vehicle for that vision, delivering the mother standard of care in my mother's memory and to honor her. We've delivered that care to more than 90,000 patients from every state in our nation and many foreign countries since we opened our doors here in Illinois three decades ago. And Gateway for Cancer Research has been a driver for clinical trials, also innovative, novel clinical trials, also since 1991, bringing us ever closer to finding a cure, the cure so many patients have hoped someone might work hard enough to give them, and no one seems to care. That's changed. More change is coming. So what have we accomplished to date? Well, since 91, Gateway has raised more than $75 million, you've heard that, for cancer research. That needs to be emphasized as the net money that went to clinical research, not what you hear, oh, we raised another $5 million, $4.2 million went to infrastructure costs. 800000 went to something to do with what you came to support. These $75 million went immediately to clinical research. That's why our research has been more effective. There were no salaries paid to our staff, this remarkable staff. There were no offices rented and transportation provided and all the other things you must have to run a global foundation, which is Gateway. Those were paid, those were paid by our family. That's why the $75 million is much bigger in its impact than what you might otherwise sense. That really went to clinical trials. These trials that we funded were 150 in nature in rounded terms worldwide, including many trials, as you heard uh, Melissa say, here in Chicago. In fact, 85 really promising trials of the 150 would not have proceeded without gateway support, and here's the consequence of that. Nearly four, this is a little piece that I found, nearly 4,500 of these patients to date, now these are enrolled and treated and taken care of, very novel trials, risky trials, 4,500 were, were enrolled to date, been treated successfully. This number, believe it or not, is four times the population in the little town in Sheridan, Indiana, where I was born and so was Larry Day. Now that <laughs> is a meaningful statistic to us. We look around and there were 1,200 people there. So, and happily, 70% of Gateway-supported trials have been so successful, they progress to the next phase of research and closer to cures for tens and tens of thousands more patients. The clinical trial sets the path. It, if it's successful, it moves to another level where it goes into the clinics more widely and then tens of thousands of people have a chance to live. That's the power of what you do and that was what you're explaining, honey. It's fabulous. Well, while we celebrate impressive achievements, and these really are, we must all focus on the efforts that lie ahead if we're to really eradicate this monster disease. That's why we're not resting on our laurels. We'll continue to identify and pursue bold new strategies to defeat cancer, kick it to the curb, not what a former, oh, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> defeat What's cancer that other story? every day in every way. He was goofy. I'm sorry. We're reinventing <laughs> and reinvigorating our mission with new and innovative programs, novel trials, and breakthrough strategies. And we'll continue to assure you and everyone who, like you, gives 99 cents of every dollar to Gateway, that it will be spent in clinical trials to save another man or woman or a baby's life. And we'll tell you the results. We'll tell you the results. We're the first one to come to the world and tell you what the impact of your dollar has been. We keep our donors informed on where did the money go, what was the result of the trial, and by the way, we're the first to discipline the research community. Listen to this. Some have, heard you, some have heard me say it before. Many trials are funded in part by device makers and or by drug manufacturers in hopes that trial will progress to the point where there's enough data to support their appeal to the Food and Drug Administration for marketing approval. 
What you don't know is if those trials have been effective and patients are on the trials and doing well and surviving, when the trial data is in hand, they take the data, go to the FDA and get approval for marketing, and what happened to the patients? They died. What part of the ethical, what part of the ethical world do you think that is? It's not, it's outside ethics. It's immoral. You get the information you need, patients are wholly dependent upon this working trial, and you take the data, but you also take the medications from them. We discovered that five years, six years ago. What, when did we discover that, Teresa? Five or six years ago? In a trial of ours in St. Louis, remarkable institution, this lady came, because we don't hold a board meeting without listening to our patients and the researchers who serve the patients. We start every board meeting finding out what has our trial been in the life of the patient we serve and the researchers who are so courageously pursuing these novel therapies. We have the lady, she has two children. Her story is remarkable, one of those dread diseases, like so many are, for which there's no hope. She's in remission. There's nobody in remission. She's not only in remission, no sign of the disease. Everything's going well. I happened to ask our president, six months later, what happened to Louise? Oh, she died. What do you mean she died? She was thriving, right, radiant. Children were excited. All kinds of games being played. What happened? The drug manufacturer took the drug away from her. We changed the way research is conducted at that very bit. Of that's not moral, immoral. You have to, if you're getting a trial from us, if we're funding your trial, you're gonna see some very bold letters in the agreement. If the medications you're using, the device you're employing for the benefit of these patients works, you damn well better keep it going, buddy, or you don't get our money, period. Well, Again, tell us how you really feel. Tell them how I feel. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> I'm going to tell them how I really feel. Tell them how you really right. feel. We'll also pull the money back from major institutions if, in fact, they're not doing what they said they're going to do. We're only and always about the patient. I'm sure you're getting that feeling by now, and I know you are too. That's why, when I say to you, we'll further assure you, assure you of our ethical stewardship of your gifts. You'll know where the money went. You'll know how we're administering the money. You'll know exactly what the results of the trials are. We'll continue to expand our collaborations with high-impact partners in industry, academic research, and the public sector. We don't, expect, we don't accept, however, government money, but we'll work with them on projects. I know I was so finished about an hour ago. <laughs> with anyone, anywhere, and any time, you can count That's on wonderful. us as the best partner you're going to have. We're a partner that doesn't give up. We're a partner that never quits. That's the nature of the family. We are care that never quits. And if those have a cancer diagnosis that you know and need a trial, you know a place to go. Well, we're going to get through this together, just as you've always been with us as we've, been, as we've done these things together. You're wonderfully generous and bold beneficiaries. You'll let nothing stand between you and your passion to end this horrible disease. And you probably have guessed it, neither will we. Neither will we. We'll fight. <laughs> we'll fight for the patients we serve. And we happen to know it's always and only, always and only about the patients we serve. We'll end cancer once and for all. Thank you for joining us. And now it's time to kick the tires, light the fires, and get on down the road. So tighten your seat belts, get ready for the greatest gateway. I'll see you on the dance floor in a little bit. Thank you. Oh, my. <laughs>